for now, I have the privilege and joy to be in the sanctuary at least six feet apart from Allison and Ashley and Amy O'Brien, who is our camera person, and Mary Croner Ekstrand, our director of religious education, and Greg Penner, our board moderator, are co hosting from their own homes, uh, helping us with the Zoom part and welcoming all of you to this time and space together. We are still learning how to use this technology. We are still figuring out our internet connections and what they can handle and what all the internet connect connections can handle on a Sunday morning when everyone tries to church online. We are grateful that you are here with us. Next week, it may be different. Next week, we may be all coming to you from our own homes, but for right now, we are here, sanctuary coming to you. And now I am going to invite the kids to come forward. Come forward right up close to your screen if you want. Come forward right up close, snuggling in with your grown-ups. I wish that you were here with me, sitting next to me. But right now we need to keep a little more space because we need to keep everybody safe. And the story that I'm going to tell today is from a book written by Laura Ingalls Wilder. She wrote the Little House on the Prairie books. And some of you may have read those. I read them as a child. My mother read them as a child. They were written in about the 1940s and they take place in the mid 1800s as folks were um, settling the, across the United States and creating homesteads. Um, Laura Ingalls Wilders, Laura Ingalls, her family um, went to a homestead. There was one on the banks of Plum Creek and there was one, um, and I honestly don't even know what state it was in, but they came across and they got a homestead, but they only had one year to grow crops on the sod. And, and it was hard to grow crops that first year on sod. Um, it wasn't very good soil yet. And so they got potatoes and they got some turnips and they got some hay and that was most of it. And one day Pa Ingalls was in the uh, town that they lived in and there was a, there was a town here that that helped support the homesteaders. And the train came in and brought a little meat and things like tea and flour and sugar that the folks needed that they couldn't grow themselves. But most things they, they got themselves and they grew themselves. Um, but when Pa Ingalls was in the town this day, um, a Native American came in and warned folks that the winter was gonna be a very hard one. One of the things you need to know when you're reading these books is that they didn't treat the Native Americans very well. And, and the way that they spoke about them is not a way that we would speak about people today. But nevertheless, this, this Native American came into the town and told them that this was gonna be a very long winter, that it was gonna last seven months. And so the family moved into town into a little tiny, tiny house that they had on the main street. And for the next seven months, there were blizzards. The temperature got down to 40 below zero. It was freezing cold, even inside the house. They had coal for a while and then the train stopped running. And so they couldn't get any more coal to burn. And so Pa Ingalls would go out and he would get hay from their land where they had planted the hay and they had cut it and put it into haystacks and they had to bring it back and the family would twist hay really tightly into these sticks that they could burn in their stove and that was how they cooked and stayed warm because there wasn't any more coal to burn. And there was almost no food, they ate potatoes and they had some flour. And in about January, all of the flour ran out. And so 
there is a story about um, Pa Ingalls went and he saw that there was a family or a couple of brothers, um, Royal and Almanzo. And they had built, Almanzo had some seed wheat that he had saved that he was gonna plant next year. And he didn't wanna sell his seed wheat even though Royal was a shopkeeper and said he could get a really good price for it because people were really hungry, but he didn't want to sell his seaweed. And so he built an extra wall inside the house and he hid his wheat in there. But when Pa Ingalls saw that the food had run out in his house, he had seen and knew that the inside of the house wasn't as big as the outside of the house. And he knew that there was a peg that hung up some saddles on the inside of the house. And he went in with a bucket and he pulled the peg out and he held the bucket under there and the wheat came out into the bucket. And he pegged it back up and Almanzo said, I'm not, you can't have that, that's my seed wheat. And, I'll, and, and Pa Engel said, my family is hungry. They're starving, we don't have anything to eat. And uh, Almanzo sold him that wheat, but eventually Almanzo and another young man in the town went off because they'd heard this rumor that somebody down a hundred miles away had farmed wheat and that he might have some. And so they took off between blizzards with horses and they found this man and they bought I don't know how much wheat, but they bought a bunch of wheat and they put it into 125 pound sacks and they brought it back. And that wheat was enough for the town to make it through the winter until the train could come again in the spring. We are closed up right now in our houses, but we can still play outside because it's sunny. We are eating what's out of our pantries but if you are down to nothing but potatoes and stone wheat, give me a call and we can fix that. People have gotten through hard times before and you just have to do the next right thing. Who knows where that comes from? Amy knows where that comes from. <laughs> Frozen 2 is now on Disney Plus, by the way. <laughs> People get through hard things and we get through hard things with great love. And I love you and I look forward to seeing your faces again soon. And sometime we will be doing this on Zoom and I will get to see your faces and that will make my heart happy. Now is the time in our service when we usually light candles of joy and sorrow. We are working on a way to do that for next week. You can email me your joys and sorrows or we'll find a way to do it using the chat feature on Zoom. But we don't wanna talk over one another in a group of 80 or so folks. And so for today, I am gonna tell us about one special joy or sorrow um, that I am holding right now, and that is that Joan Young, who is in our congregation, um, had surgery on Thursday uh, for cancer, and she is in the hospital. And we hold her and her husband, John, and their family and all of those who love their, her in our hearts. In, <clears throat> in a little while, when our service is over, we are going to invite folks to stay for a virtual coffee hour. And we will put you into smaller groups on Zoom and let you unmute your microphones and talk with each other. And that will be a good time to share your joys and your concerns with one another. We know that there are so many things right now that we are holding, that we are worried about, and that we are grateful for. And so we will share those with each other shortly. 
But for now, will you pray with me? Spirit of life and love, we gather together in virtual community today, holding tight to these real life connections at a time when so many of us are scared and lonely. Help us to know that we are never truly alone. We have each other. Help us to know that whatever we are feeling right now is okay. We may be frightened for ourselves or our loved ones or all the helpers in the community. We may be cranky and irritable from spending too much time in close proximity to in our homes or lonely because we don't have anyone else with us. Patients may be short Nerves may be tested. Help us to remember that this is kind of like grief in that there is no one right or wrong way to do it. And it doesn't go away because it feels like it should be time. And if it's possible, help us to see that there are some things to be grateful for. If we can still go outside, and see the flowers and the sunshine, that is something to be grateful for. If we have someone with whom to share the work of caring for children or running a household, that's something to be grateful for. If we have enough food to eat, if we have toilet paper and running water, that's something to be grateful for. If we have pets to curl up with, who purr or get us outside for walks, May we be grateful for that, for all the big feelings, for the steep learning curves, whether it's technology or cooking or working from home, for all the birthdays and new babies and the cycles of life that keep turning. That is something to be grateful for. May we be patient, may we be kind, May we be the helpers. Blessed be and amen. And now we are going to sing Spirit of Life. has changed so much since the long winter was written. The Ingalls family survived barely on potatoes and hand ground wheat baked into bread for months. They burned knotted hay to stay warm. They worried that they'd become too used to creature comforts like their kerosene lamp. It is an entirely different culture. Almost none of us grow all of our own food, let alone spin wool and make all of our own clothes. 
we are so much more interdependent than we used to be. We each do something. We may be nurses or teachers or technology workers rather than a family working together <clears throat> to meet all of our own needs, at least until the train comes. There's the moment in the story where Pa Ingalls goes into the Wilder boy's home and gets the wheat from Almanzo. Almanzo doesn't want to eat that wheat or sell it. He wants to save it for next year so he can plant it. He's playing the long game, saving for the future, all values that we believe are important. A friend posted this and said, what's your seed corn? That which you need to hold on to in this difficult time so you have enough to plant to get through the next year. Totally valid. I know that I am struggling with this already I am trying to minister to you in a really difficult time in ways that I don't yet know. And I am learning. We need to be terribly, profoundly gentle with ourselves and with one another these days. But for me, the other real question in the seed wheat is, what are you hoarding that your neighbor might need? There are ways in which playing the long game is really important right now. We need to count on this going on for a while. It is not going to be over in two weeks. And we need to take care of ourselves in that time. Don't feel like you need to work all the hours and spend eight hours a day homeschooling your children. You have to save some reserves for later. And we also need to take care of each other. Because if we finish this with a full pantry and our neighbors have starved, we didn't do it right. If we fight a mother with three kids for the last package of toilet paper in the grocery store, we're not doing it right. Our healthcare workers don't have enough masks or gloves or hand sanitizer. Seriously, St. Vincent's is a couple of days away from having doctors and nurses wear bandanas over their faces. Most of that is a supply issue. China makes most of the surgical masks and rightfully they are keeping theirs these days because they need them. But some people are hoarding and that's not helpful. One of our seven principles as Unitarian Universalists is justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. What does that mean in a time of social distancing? What does that mean in a time when we are being asked to stay in our homes and only interact with our families and stay quite a ways away from everyone else? Most of the time when folks are scared, we hold tighter to a scarcity mentality. We think there isn't enough for all of us, and so I have to protect myself and my family. I have to buy all the things. It's kind of like that irrational fear that immigrants are taking our jobs. Well, this isn't the long winter. We are not waiting for the one train that has all the supplies but is stuck in the ice somewhere east of here. Yes. We are scared and tired and flummoxed <laughs> and all the things. And yet, there is also so much hope. People have started different groups to help their neighbors. I passed by a paper bag on my block when I was walking the dog that said free snacks that was filled with granola bars and almond butter and pretzels. I've had folks email me to offer help to congregants and I haven't yet had anyone who's let me know that they needed help. 
There is no shame in needing help. All of us will need help at some point. Most of us can offer help at some point. Maybe it's calling a friend or a fellow congregant to check in. Maybe your pantry is pretty stocked and you can check and see if somebody needs a meal or a bag of rice. Maybe you can find a way to keep six feet apart from people and still hand out food boxes like the Steins and several others did for the Hope Food Pantry on Friday. And maybe, like 20% of Oregonians, you lost your job and are worried about how to pay your electrical bill or not having enough food. Or maybe you're in a higher risk group and can't go out for groceries. Call or email me, we can help. We are still figuring all this out. And I know it's hard. I know that extroverts and huggers are going a little crazy right now. I know that folks who live alone are lonely and folks who are happily married and love their children fiercely still might do best with just a little bit of alone time or time with other people. So let's be profoundly gracious with each other. Let's save enough seed wheat to make it through, but not hoard anything. Let's check in on each other and be kind and patient, and let's also figure out how to get our own needs met, even if that's taking a really long bath. Whatever, whether that's human communication or time alone or whatever it is that we need. My friend Joanna Fontaine Crawford had a family pity party on Friday night. They dressed in comfy clothes, they ate all the best snacks, and they took turns going around and saying everything that they were sad about. No fixing or shaming or even looking on the bright side aloud. Yes, it is horrible and you'll probably miss prom too and your dress is so beautiful. Yes, it stinks that you don't get to go to that trip or that concert or see that show that you've been looking for forever. What is not allowed in a family pity party is putting things in perspective. For just an hour or so, it's all about the losses. Once you've finished what you're sad about, then you go into all of the things that you're afraid of. But the good thing about starting with all the big things and going around and around is that at some point you will probably end up getting silly and that's a good thing too. There is so much of the both and right now. It is really hard. And there is still so much to be grateful for. It's really lonely and we have each other. There will be losses and we will help each other through them. In coffee hour, at the end of the service, you are invited to stay and we'll put you into smaller groups on Zoom. And I'm going to invite you to share the both and with each other. What is hardest for you right now? What are you missing? What frightens you? And where are you finding hope? May you find hope somewhere. Blessed be and amen. One of our affiliated community ministers, the Reverend Amy Beltane, is in Portugal where she and her spouse are moving. And she is going to lead us in a guided meditation right now. And then we are going to come back here for another song and our closing words and our coffee hour. Amy? So good to be with you all. 
through the miracle of the internet. I wanted to invite us all to pay attention to our physical selves. I know I have been spending a lot of time on Facebook and listening to the news and worrying and spending a lot of time spinning up here in the brain and worrying in the heart. And I need, and I imagine many of us need, to get into our whole selves. And also, our whole selves as my favorite thing, which is imagining ourselves as trees. So I invite you to take a deep breath. And to notice your spine and the bones that are holding you holding you together, holding you up. Like the trunk of the tree, the strength of you, the strength of your body. You might want to reach up, let your spine lengthen, reach up with your hands, Imagine that you are a tree and those branches are reaching out. <sighs> feel the stretch, feel into your body and how it's inviting you to become your full tree-ness, your tree self. And also pressing down Noticing the way you are supported by your chair, by your legs, by your feet, by your house, by the earth. Each of us is complete and whole as an individual. And each of us needs the interchange, the interaction, the creativity, the connection of the wind through the branches, of the ideas that move between us, of the fruits that we give, the gifts that we create on our tree branches that we give to the world around us. And each of us needs nurture and the connection that comes through the way we are rooted into the earth and into our family and into our story. And the way we take up nourishment each day. So I'm inviting you to notice the way you bring in nourishment to fill yourself up and the way that you give. I'm inviting you to breathe deeply. And remember one of the most fabulous things about trees that we've been learning lately, that underground, below awareness, they are connected to each other, even in ways we cannot see or even understand. They are interconnected. And that is true for our human communities as well. We, even while we feel like individual trees, we are part of the vast forest and the community, the community of nature, the community of human beings, the community of this universe. And again, I invite you to breathe in. Notice what your body is asking to do, asking of you. And breathe out, releasing the anxiety that you don't need to carry with you. And remember, you can come back to this tree meditation anytime you need it. And notice the way you are connected and the way your body is deeply integrated and supported.
and nourished and how you can give. Amen. Blessed be. Thank you, Amy. And we are going to sing again. We're going to sing There's More Love Somewhere. And hopefully this is very familiar to you. I will um, give you cues as to which verse we're going to do next. But there's more love somewhere. There's more hope. There's more peace. There's more joy. Let's sing together. There is more love somewhere. As Scott Silver sings and Sheila told us about, there is more love in me. Keep on until we find it. Keep on coming back to it. Again and again and again. You matter. Your life matters. You are a beloved child of the universe and a beloved part of this community, and you don't have to do it alone. Stay in peace. Stay in love. Blessed be and amen, my friend. After our postlude, you are invited to stay for a virtual coffee hour. You, uh, if you stay, we will put you into breakout groups and we'll wait and do that until um, after the postlude is over and give you a moment and then we'll put you into breakout groups so they stay about the same size. I look forward to seeing you there. Your friends look forward to talking to you. We will be in touch more and more throughout the week, my friends. Be well, be safe. Know that you are so profoundly loved. Blessed be and amen.